And I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago that my introduction to this material was in 2005 when I attended a, a workshop simply called Bridges Out of Poverty. And the material by Ruby Payne, who was an uh, educator, uh, she has a PhD uh, and, and she's, she was in education. She's the one that a lot, in fact, most of what we will look at tonight comes from her. She's the one that designed the poverty quiz or the, uh, the, the quiz that we took last week. Could you survive, or as I, I put it, could you live comfortably in poverty, in middle class, and in wealth? Uh, that's her, her quiz. And it's in all of her material. She wrote a book called What Every Church Member Should Know About Poverty. And a lot of, uh, a lot of min ministry groups have their churches read this. These are all on your uh, work book list, and you can see where to order them if you want to look at Amazon. I would strongly encourage you to, to look at some of Ruby Payne's material. It's, an, it's a real eye-opener. It was for me. Like I said, 2005, I went through this, and it, it, it was kind of an aha moment. In fact, that's what she calls her organization, AHA Process. And so uh, she, uh, she has these two. But uh, one other book that I want to introduce you to was written by Kathy Butler, and she did this for the WMU. Uh, just as I wrote articles for WMU uh, periodicals, she wrote a book for the WMU called Breaking the Cycle, uh, Issues Affecting Poverty. And I, I, I'm using her book tonight to make a point, to illustrate something, because of one of the things she said takes us right up into where we are going to be picking up tonight after our, our break from two weeks ago. We finished up two weeks ago with a quiz in which I presented a proposition for you. I said, you know, uh, that quiz we took of could you live comfortably in poverty? Could you live comfortably in middle class? Could you live comfortably in wealth? was not surprising for me. Every, every place I go, the results are almost always the same. I, I, I mostly, and I've made this comment to you a couple weeks ago, most Southern Baptist churches operate from a middle class worldview, a middle class framework. And so having said that, uh, there's some things that, that you and I need to understand when we deal with, deal with people who are not from a middle class worldview. A couple weeks ago, I uh, had this test with you, and that was not the test. Going through that list of things to find out where you were comfortable, that, that wasn't the test. The test was the question that came afterwards, and that was simply this. If you suddenly had a windfall, would you be tempted to move from living in a middle class worldview to a wealthy worldview, given the things that you saw were part of the wealthy world worldview? And we'll see more of that tonight, by the way. And for the most part, it, with the exception of Danny, I think, uh, everybody said, no, no, wouldn't do that. And, and, and I suspect that, Danny, you really wouldn't feel comfortable over there either. And, I don't know. It, it looked awful appealing. I understand. But it, it isn't the perks. It's being comfortable with the worldview, the thinking, what makes people comfortable in that particular section. And just as most of you said, you would not consciously try to move from middle class to wealth, even given the resources. My question was, then why do we expect people in poverty to want to become middle class because we provide things for them? And that was the big, that was the big aha moment that most churches where I share this would have because they realize we've been more in the effort of trying to make people in poverty like us than like Jesus. And that's, that, that became the basis of my ministry is to help churches find ways to, pe to reach people who may never make more than 20000 a year for a family of four and still be able to pray, to have faith in God, to witness, and to develop a disciplined life that is godly. 
I saw this happen in so many settings in the areas here in West Tennessee where I was where I was serving in this. So this is where I want us to go and start with tonight. I want to start tonight with a something that comes out of uh, how many of you ever when you go to the the, the doctor's office or the dentist's office you you look for something that you feel comfortable reading and and still find yourselves looking for a reader's digest i don't know if people still read reader's digest or not i love the little humor and uniform and the different kinds of th things i remember i read an article in a reader's digest one time uh, that had to deal with what they called an urban IQ test. I thought, well, this is interesting. And one of the examples they gave of the urban IQ test was what I'm getting ready to show you on the, on the screen uh, here behind me. Uh, I want you to take a look at this. Now, by the way, <clears throat> I know that looks like dice, but it's a Yahtzee, okay? It's, it's a Yahtzee cup, it's a Yahtzee dice, there's five of them there. But look at the question, which is greater? The total of the dice showing, the total number, add them up, which is greater, the total of the, of the numbers showing on top or the total of the bottom numbers that are not showing? Which is greater? Let me just ask you this. How many of you know right off? Not really? Well, I'll give you the answer. The answer is the, it's the numbers showing. They were one, they were two through six, okay? If you remember, see them, two, three, four, five, and six. Some people say they're the same. No, they're not. Because there's six faces uh, or six numbers that you can choose from. And what's missing in that is the one. You see, the number showing equal 20. Six plus four uh, plus five plus three plus two is 20. The numbers on the bottom only equal 15. How do I know that? Well, because under the 6, there's a 1. Under the 5, there's a 2. Under the 4, there's a 3. Under the 3, there's a 4. Under the 2, there's a 5. And under the 1 is a 6. And you say, how did you know that? It's because the flip side of all dice equals 7. How many of you knew that? Now, here's where I would usually, and, I, and, and most churches I was in, <clears throat> they didn't know me, and I could get away with it. And I said, you didn't know that? <laughs> You're stupid. Everybody knows that. Everybody knows that, don't they? You see, that's what Kathy Butler found out. Reading from her book, and, and it's interesting because she quotes Ruby Payne. She says, uh, Ruby Payne, author of A Framework for Understanding Poverty, maintains that when the poor do not know the unwritten rules of the upper classes, middle and upper class, they're wrongly seen as being stupid or unteachable. And as long as a helper tries to relate to the poor by talking down to them, we talked about this a couple weeks ago about the voice that we use, that if we're using a parent voice to try to correct them all the time, we're automatically setting a gap between us that makes ministry nearly impossible. As long as a helper tries to relate to the poor by talking down to them, there will be no real relationship built. And that is significant, as we'll see as we get further into the study tonight. The belief that poor people are stupid, lazy, or uncaring is only one example of a damaging stereotype that keeps people apart. We need to stop thinking that people who don't know what we know are stupid. We need to realize that they know things we don't know. And that's why this was an urban IQ test. This, by the way, was a math question. Not a street smarts question. This was a math question because they assumed that everybody in the urban areas who knew these things knew that dice at the back, the flip side of Avery dice equals seven. So it was a math question. And that's what made it different. What we want to look at tonight, we've been already talking about worldviews and that worldviews is how you view the world. That worldviews differ greatly between the economic classes. And if we don't realize this, our efforts to try to minister and communicate 
and to reach out to them will be thwarted and there'll be difficulty. The uh, not recognizing the difference will affect how we view those we are seeking to help and how they receive our ministry. And so that's what makes this study tonight so very important. And like I say, most of what you're going to hear tonight comes straight from Ruby Payne and the slides were hers. I have permission to show you these slides because uh, I uh, was sent there to learn how to teach this material by Mississippi River Ministry. They paid the $1,200 so that I could go and get certified to share the things that I'm getting ready to share with you. Ruby Payne calls them the hidden rules among the classes. And, and, and all of her books, she, she makes reference to them. And, and I want to show you something because I think this is significant uh, in the way she presents them. She lays them out horizontally. Now I'm showing you this because on the slides they're not going to be horizontal. They're going to be vertical. But she lays them out horizontally and she calls them the hidden rules among the classes. And on this side here, it just talks about the different things that we'll see slides of. How those in the, all three areas, poverty, middle class, and wealth, how they view things like time, money, uh, food, education, destiny, family structure. I don't put all of them up here. I think the two most significant that we'll see tonight is, is going to be in relationship to driving force and to love. And like I said, once I sat and listened to it, I began to realize she's describing people that we minister to in Honduras. That it was a poverty worldview, not just people in America. Now, I did not mention this last time, two weeks ago, but I started to, but I just I, I got distracted. I tend to do that sometimes. But when we talk about poverty, there is, and the slides that we see tonight will apply primarily to those who are affected by what's called generational poverty. I did mention this. They're in poverty, their parents were in poverty, their grandparents were in top poverty. At least two or more generations before them lived in poverty. And so what began to be passed down was the values. But there is also, and I do, I do remember, because I went back and looked at it, I did, I did mention to you that there's situational poverty. Situational poverty is when a guy loses his job. He loses his job and then consequently loses his house. And when he loses his house, sometimes he loses his family. And he finds himself out on the street. But he lives in a very, more of a middle class mindset. He just doesn't have the resources. We have friends that, that are like that. I shared that with you two weeks ago. There's a third group that I didn't mention two weeks ago that I'll mention tonight. There's institutionalized poverty. Back in the 1960s, Lyndon Baines Johnson began his war on poverty. Some of you old enough to remember that. Put into effect uh, things that are still going on pretty much today in terms of social, what they looked upon as social justice. Uh, things like welfare. WIC, uh, food stamps, a lot of those things were set into place. And, and, and in the 1960s, and I've done this in a lot of churches, and I've, I've never been challenged, and, and I don't think I will be here tonight either. There was one particular stipulation to the families that could receive these things. It wasn't just the poverty level, but for the majority, like the, the food stamps and the welfare and the so forth, was that, that there wasn't a man in the household. They created broken homes and then continued to, to uh, systemize it so that we have today institutionalized poverty that simply perpetuates the situation of one generation to another. And that's part of what we're dealing with as well. So, what we want to do is to now look at those hidden rules. What are some of these values that, that we find that you and I don't think of? If I say the word possession, uh, let, let me get a little interaction here. Okay? When I say word possession, what's your favorite possession? Somebody, j just shout it out. What's your favorite possession? Truck. Okay. What else? Huh? 
Phone? Okay. Oh, home. I'm sorry, home. Because when I say possession, you think things. Because possession in middle class is things. Possession in poverty is people. You say, what do you mean? Your family. And this is one reason why a lot of families say, I don't want my son to go off to college. He'll leave home. And I will lose my son. Or I will lose my daughter. And as, as, as I think you can understand where in, in, in middle class, we look at things as our possessions. But possessions are those things that give you identity. They give you comfort. They give you security. In poverty, it's their people who give them their identity, their comfort, and their security. Is there anything wrong with being people-centered? No, not a thing. That's why one of the reasons I thought it was appropriate that when she's lined them up, she lined them up horizontally, is because when we look at them vertically, we almost think that one is better than the other, and that's not going to be the case. When we look at these three areas, and by the way, let me just go ahead and throw up, in wealth, it's one-of-a-kind objects. In other words, people of wealth, their, their greatest possession is that which they have that nobody else can have. Would you like to see my Picasso? Would you like to see my, and it's usually something that is a collectible of some, of some sort. It's one-of-a-kind objects. It's, it's the legacy. It's the pedigree that comes with it. And so whereas we would be, who cares? They're, oh, you got to be kidding. Nobody has this, but we do. And so even possessions are looked upon differently. But what makes poverty so significant here is that because they are people-oriented, there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you don't become promiscuous or incestuous. Because you look at your family as your possession. See, that's what sin does to worldview. Sin takes our worldview and then perverts it and takes it in directions that it, it dare not go to. We just happen to see many times the, the, the difficulties with what this particular worldview takes them into. You wouldn't be like that if you didn't think like that. But in middle class... What is covetousness? What is envy? What is jealousy? If it's not the, the sinful approach to possessions. Many times we want them to become like us. All we want them to do is trade their sins for ours. We have sins too. And they grow out of our worldviews, just like theirs grows out of their worldviews. And that's why trying to get them to be like us is not really accomplishing anything. They're just trading sins. What about uh, money? How do people in poverty view money? Well, interesting is that uh, for them, money is to be used. It's to be spent. When do you spend it? When you get it. Whereas in middle class, we think money is to be managed. And this is how we think, and this is how, our, how we are taught to think. Uh, when you get a phone call, and the church secretary gets a phone call, and they need help with a utility bill, and you ask the question, when did you get your check? You may hear them say, last Thursday. And you don't have any money for your utilities right now? Well, not if they had a big weekend party, they don't. Because as we'll see when we get to driving forces, entertainment and relationships is high on the list. Work and achievement is not. So, and, and, and bear in mind, these are not things that I've put together. These are the things that Ruby Payne began to realize that was causing the low-income students in her classrooms to not get the, the lessons. And she was trying to help teachers better relate to those from the household from which they came from. In wealth, 
Money is to be conserved. It's to be invested. It's to be saved. We just don't spend it all. There's got to be something set aside. We have different approaches to how we see possessions. We have different approaches to how we see money. We have different approaches to how we see food. Now, this one I think you'll like. In, in, in poverty, what is important is quantity. Did you get enough? Isn't that what your, your grandmother, who went through the Depression, would ask you all the time? Did you get enough? Because the quantity of food is most significant, especially if you went through those lean years. Quantity was important, whereas in middle class, it's quality. Did you try the Nana pudding? Wasn't it good? Didn't you like what you had? It's, a, it's not a matter of, of, of did you have it? It's, did you like what? And we have, a, we have a society now that really doesn't, I mean, you talk about being picky. When you have people in poverty who have come to your church for a potluck dinner and then they go to the kitchen after the meal and take home three clamshell boxes of food and you say, well, what you, you know, did you see how much food they took back with them? I guarantee you that their food is not going to go to waste in the refrigerator like your leftover Fridays did or your leftover Olive Garden did. We have stuff that goes bad in the refrigerator in our little styrofoam cases. She was taking home meals for her family to make sure there was enough. And if we don't understand that, we will. You remember the dog that was biting its own back leg? We will bite on our own back leg. That was the whole point of showing this, is that if we do not understand what the perspective and what the worldview is, we're, we're going we're gonna to fuss at them. In wealth, by the way, food is not a matter of quantity or quality. It's a matter of presentation. It was presented well. What about time? And this one was the thing that really kind of spoke to us about Honduras, was that in, in, in poverty, time... Uh, the present was most important. Uh, decisions were made for the moment based on feelings or survival. And the present is most important. Whereas in middle class, it's the future that's most important. We make so many of our decisions based on future ramifications. How many of you are really, we, we talked about this when we, when we took the quiz a couple weeks ago. Uh, talk to your kids about going to college. Well, sure. Why? Because you want to spend tens of thousands of dollars? No, you want them to have a better life for themselves in the future. And that's our thinking, that's our perspective, and that's where we're looking. We're looking at what decisions do I make today that have future ramifications. Uh, people in poverty, their eyes aren't set on the future. They're set on the present. Which, by the way, the wealth, their eyes are set on the past. History. Tradition. Uh, usually in, in, in some Baptist churches, it'll be the most well-to-do family who raise their hand in the uh, business meeting and says, but we've never done it that way before. <laughs> uh, why change? Tradition is, is significant. It's important. And so as such, what we need to realize is that we see time differently. What about education? Now, when it comes to education... In poverty, education is important, but only as an abstract. They are told it's good to get an education, but they're really not sure why. Especially when, especially in urban areas, where they can make a whole lot more money doing a whole lot less. In middle class, we see education is crucial for climbing the success ladder and, and making money and, and, and building a future for yourself. And, and we look at it as even those people who lose their careers after so many years go back to school, get a new degree so that they can get into another field to climb that success ladder. That's what, they, that's what the purpose of their education was for. Whereas in wealth, it isn't about the job you're going to get. It's about the connections you're going to make. And 
in wealth that those connections and those networks are far more important. How many of you have heard it said, it's not what you know, it's who you know? Well, that comes from these, these groups that, that, that realize if, I, if my fraternity brother is now the mayor or a senator, uh, my business can get a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, perks and, and, and be looked upon favorably. It's who I know. Uh, and to some degree, we all kind of take, take a, a little part in that. But in wealth, it's, it's a big thing. We'll see in, in, as we get a little further on. Uh, this is significant when it came to that test that I gave you last week. I don't like the word destiny. That's her word, not my word. If you have a New American Standard Bible, destiny and fate are the names of two Canaanite gods. When the children of Israel came into the land of Canaan, <coughs> destiny and fate were two of the names of the gods. It, it, destiny is just kind of looked upon as how, uh, how life unfolds, how the future unfolds in front of you. In poverty, it's looked upon as unchangeable. It's fate. Can't do much to mitigate chance or change when it comes to your destiny. Uh, I told you a couple weeks ago about my sister-in-law. She had lost her car to some friends at one occasion. And on another occasion, one of her friends had taken her car. And she had to call me up. She says, I got my car back. The police found my car. But the problem was, the keys aren't in it. Now, I know you've got the title. Would you mind going down to the Honda place with the title? It's got the VIN number on it. And could you get a, another key cut for the car? Meet me in downtown Jackson. And so uh, I went down, I got, the, I got the key cut, I got the key made, and when I did, I went down and found her. And uh, she was walking up the sidewalk. I got out of my car, she was walking up the sidewalk, and I'll never forget the first thing she said, and some of you older ones, you'll be able to finish this line for me. She just kind of threw her head back and says, well, if it weren't for bad luck, there you go. Hee-haw, right? But that was also her world, world view. And by the way, this is what creates the victim mentality. Look what happened to me. Do you know how they say in Spanish, I burned the cake? Se me quemó el queque. The cake burned itself to me. It was just... I take no responsibility for the mess that I'm in because of the worldview. They believe in fate. Can't do much to, to mitigate the chance or the change. Look what has happened to me. And that's where the, the victim mentality kind of comes from. In middle class, uh, she made that statement. I, re I replied completely out of my worldview. I said, no, Debbie, you've just made some bad choices and friends. Because being middle class, I believe in choice. And as such, I believe choices can change the future with good choices now. And, this is, and, and I would dare say that most all of you would agree that that's really the kind of the way that we look at the world. Just, and I'm not saying that they're right or wrong, and I'm not saying we're right and they're wrong. What I'm saying is we're different. And if we don't recognize that difference, we're going to have a difficulty relating to them. And they're going to come across, or we're going to come across as though we're being judgmental. Interesting thing, when I, it got to the wealth on this, there's, a, there's an expression that's put up here. I'm going to put it up here. It's, it's not that significant for us. Noblesse oblige is actually a French term, and it, it just means the obligation of the noble. In other words, those who have, have responsibilities, and they need to take care of those things. Family structure. I found this interesting. How many of you have noticed that in poverty, the family structure is primarily matriarchal? In other words, it's mama's house. Okay? And you, you, can, you can mouth off, but you don't mouth off to mama. <laughs> uh, 
in poverty, it's matriarchal. This goes again back to what I was saying about the 60s, where the mother is probably the, the main person in the household in, in a leadership position. How many, though, of you would agree that in middle class, it's more patriarchal? And uh, those of you who know my background know I came from a military background. My dad was military. I can't tell you how many times my mother said to me, you wait till your father gets home. You'll take care of this. You wait till your father gets home. Now, here's the interesting thing. Which way do you think it swings when it comes to wealth? Whoever has the money. <laughs> if it's her trust fund, she calls the shots. If it's his business or his empire, he calls the shots. Because money dictates the authority there in the household. So, just something interesting to know. When you look at <clears throat> driving force, and we're, we're almost done here. When you look at driving force, this to me was the most significant. The driving force, in other words, what motivates people in poverty? What motivates people in middle class? What motivates people in wealth? People in poverty are motivated by three things. Survival, relationships, and entertainment. And if you've ever been in one of their homes, that's why they have a bigger flat screen TV than you do. When we took the test, you may recall that I, one of the questions on the test was that, or uh, one of the statements was that, uh, I know how to live without electricity and a phone. I challenged that when I went to the training. I said, they all have phones. They all have cell phones. And they said, yes, but they don't have minutes. They don't have plans. They buy their, they prepay their minutes. And before the month is up, they don't have enough. Minutes. But that cell phone is important. Why? Because it keeps them connected in their relationships. Relationships, and that's why being people-centered, relationships are so important. You remember when I mentioned to you about how I, we came up, Cindy and I came up, and, and Debbie was loading a couple of trucks with all of her stuff. And we said, where are you going? She said... I'm going to Jackson to be with my people. And by the way, have you noticed yet that these are not bad things? Have you noticed that when it comes to a tornado, people, low-income households are already up and running before middle-class people can get their insurance folks to come out and visit their house? What's that song that we used to hear all the time? A country boy will survive. Survival is, 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 is strong, and they know how to survive. They know how to build relationships, and relationships become their form of currency. And then they value the entertainment. What about middle class? Well, we talk about the middle class work ethic, don't we? We value work, we value achievement, and we value material security, <coughs> holding on to the things that we have accumulated. Those are our values. And, and, and as such, we are very work-driven. We are very achievement-driven. So uh, let me go ahead and insert here. I was asked at one point, by the uh, evangelism director of the Tennessee Baptist Convention. He says, I sat through your training about uh, uh, worldview and I found it fascinating. I want to ask you a question. Do you think if they see the world differently, they hear the gospel differently? I said, absolutely. One of the things we learned from Honduras was that we had to clothe the gospel presentation in the culture of the people we were dealing with you don't change the message, you just change the, the ways that you present the message. As I made the statement to one pastor one time, there's only one way to God, that's through, through His Son, Jesus Christ. But I hope you will admit with me, there are many ways to get people to Jesus. And that's what takes a little bit of creativity and learning of culture, and by that, realizing that the way we presented the gospel for so many years, all the ways that you've ever been to a training event for, for, for sharing the gospel, 
How many times did you see that it began with probably Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God? The middle class presentation of the gospel starts with a post-fallen man. It starts with man after sin. Presents him in his, in his condition and then tells how Jesus is able to take him and save him. Nothing wrong with that. The nail we tend to hammer so many times is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you've been saved through faith and not a result of what? Works. Lest any man should boast. And we hammer that nail. There is nothing you can do to earn your way to heaven. There is nothing you can do. No works can get you through the gates. And we, 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 we really kind of deal with that. And, and, and I do when I'm preaching here on Sunday mornings to a mostly middle class group. But let me ask you something. Do you think that works? That works resonates with those who are not interested in the work? And their value is relationship? Now some of you heard me this morning. I did it again this morning. And I did it on purpose because I knew I was going to be doing this tonight. When I was asked the question, you say they see the world differently. Do you think they hear the gospel differently? I said, most definitely. And so I was challenged. He said, why don't you write up a presentation of the gospel for those that are primarily in a poverty worldview? I said, that's a good idea. I think I will. And so I, I wrote a little track called 10 Truths Worth Considering. Gave a, gave a copy to all my deacons, and they all have seen it. And the first four truths are the only ones that are different from the ones that you're used to sharing. It's by truth number five that we say that all men are sinful and separated from God. But the first four have to deal with the fact that God created us for the purpose of knowing us and to have an intimate relationship with us through worship and fellowship. I said those very words this morning. That was the reason God made us. And I've told you before something that I discovered when I was going through all of this. You and I are saved for the same reason we were made. We were made to reflect the image of God. We are saved to reflect the image of God. Heaven is just an added plus. We get to go to heaven because we have surrendered ourselves to be made new by Jesus Christ. Now, by doing that, what I said at the very beginning for them was that the most important thing God had in mind when He created man was a relationship with you. Do you know God wanted to have a relationship with you more than anything else that He ever created? And that's where your value is? Is because He wanted to have a relationship with you? And so the whole emphasis on that presentation that's in that particular uh, uh, booklet, or, or actually it's a track, it's a trifle. If you want a copy, I'll bring you copies next time we get together. But it is simply as this, that God created us to have a special relationship with us, but sin got in the way. Sin broke that relationship. And then that sin was passed to all men, so no, nobody born into this world has a relationship with God apart from through His Son, Jesus Christ, and that's when the rest of the presentation of the gospel becomes more significant. By the way, the tenth truth has to do with hell. I realized after I'd gotten through nine, I'd never mentioned hell. I said, I guess I better mention hell. So then I wrote that those who choose not to receive the grace of God to reestablish a relationship with Him are to be separated from Him from all eternity. And instead of using a place of torment, I said a place of loneliness where there are no friends. Don't ever let somebody tell you, oh, I'm, I'd rather go to hell and be with my friends. You just smile at them and say, I'm sorry you've been deceived. You won't know anybody in hell. In fact, one of the ways Jesus dis, uh, it's described in, in, in the book of Revelation is a bottomless pit. Jesus described it as outer darkness. You won't know anybody in hell. It's the loneliest place you can possibly imagine. And when you start emphasizing loneliness, now you're hitting a nail that, they're, that they can feel. So you see, knowing their culture 
makes an impact on the way we are able to communicate better to them. What's the driving force of wealth? I, again, I'm not going to harp on this. Financial, political, social connections. It's, it's power. The driving force in wealth is power. Which brings us to our last one. Love. Now, again, these are her words, not mine. But when I read these, it's like it jumped off the page. And I've got it set up to where it'll, hopefully it'll jump off the page to you as well. In poverty... Love and acceptance are conditional based on whether the individual is liked. I met Debbie and I said, hey, I've got your key. I got you something else too. Here's the title to your car. I'm not going to hold it anymore. I'm giving you your car. I'm giving you the key. I'm giving you the, the title to the car. I'm done. And I'm convinced that I was unable to reach Debbie the way I should have. Because if you remember the timeline, I said, she got out of prison around 2001. This is around 2002 now. It's going to be three more years before I'm ever introduced to any of these concepts. I didn't know any of this stuff when we were trying to reach Debbie. And the bottom line is she ended up going to... to Washington State to live with her daughter. I will say that we've had contact with her since then. She came back when their, their father passed. In fact, we paid to bring her back when their father passed. And you know one of the first things she did when she came back was she went to Carol. You remember the hairdresser who hired her? She went back to Carol and she apologized for de deserting her the way she did. She said, I was still in a messed up state. And I just want to say I'm sorry for the way I treated you when I was here. And we kind of thought, well, we're taking a chance. We're bringing her back. She may be staying. No, she said, I've got to get back. I've got things to take care of back there. She went back. We still pray for Debbie. But now here's the thing about it. She didn't think I liked her. So I could never tell her that I, I loved her or that Jesus loved her. Or that God loved her. Because if they don't think you like them, they, think, they don't think you can possibly love them. Regardless of how you try to say it. In middle class, love and acceptance, again, her words, not mine, are conditional based largely on achievement. Um, I thought it was significant. I had a... a in the presentation I was doing this. Can I just take y'all a few more extra minutes? Y'all were late coming in anyway. I, I just got to tell you this story. Um, one of the pastors who was going through this particular workshop raised his hand. He says, I got a question for you, Brother Randy. In our church, when people call for help, we, uh, we ask them one question. Which do you prefer? Yard work or housework? And then he kind of sat back, folded his arms, and he says, are we right in doing that? And I knew exactly what he was saying. He was, he was thinking Paul, who said, if a man won't work, don't let him eat. And that was his thinking. And my response to him was, I'll tell you what, I, I, I feel like you're, you're doing this out of respect to the Word of God about what Paul said about if a man doesn't work, he doesn't eat. So who am I to argue with Paul? I'm not going to argue with Paul. But here's what I would say. When, you, when they decide whether they're going to do housework or yard work, you take someone from your church, put it alongside them. Not as a supervisor, not as a boss, not as someone who's overseeing the work but someone who just spends time getting to know them, talking to them, finding out their story, and making a friend with them. You see, you're going to approach them from your worldview that if they accomplish what you want them to accomplish, you will demonstrate love for them. Understand that. But why don't you enter into their worldview and build a relationship? And when you build a relationship 
you will get a, so much more than just a clean house or a clean yard and a clear, and a clear conscience about giving them some money. You might just win a soul to Jesus. We think that if they do what we ask them to, we can demonstrate something for them. With wealth, I find it fascinating. <clears throat> Love and acceptance are conditional related to your social standing and your connections. Do you remember the, the quiz we took last week? And I asked you the question then, if, if you had the resources, would you move from here to here? It was a trick question. <laughs> you can't. They won't let you. Have you ever heard of the Beverly Hillbillies? It doesn't matter how much money you've got. You'll never be one of them. Because it's all about the social standing and the connections that have been, been achieved throughout your life. They may let you come to their parties. But you'll have a hard time getting in if you don't have the connections. Now, what's wrong with all three of these statements? Absolutely. And again, her words, not mine. This is what told me that all worldviews are worldly views because they, we, we are taught by the world how to, how to, to practice them. And so, whereas, and, and I'm going to kind of go back to a horizontal view now. I think this would be a little bit more helpful. When we talk about, and, and this is, I'm closing now. Ministry through a poverty worldview means that we first begin to understand their perspective. We see them the way they see themselves. That's why we looked at these things tonight. Secondly, we acknowledge the difference as neither better nor worse than our own worldview, especially if we all learned our worldview from the world. But thirdly, we move them from a poverty worldview not to a middle class worldview, but to a biblical worldview. And we do so in an effort to make them, again, more like Jesus, not more like us. And we do it by using Scripture for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. The only handout that I haven't talked to you about is this last one, and I'm not even going to go over it. Just take it home with you. It is called Scriptures Related to Finances. There's a website on the bottom that I, I cite where I got it from. But as you look through here, you're going to find out that there are Scriptures here that relate to finances, and some of these things you're not doing. I say that because I know some of these things I'm not doing. This is what the Bible t teaches us about how we need to handle our finances. And so maybe the best way to help others is not to make them like us, but to say, you know what? And we'll, we'll look at it this way. Oh, let me just throw this up here for what's worth it. No significant learning occurs without significant relationship. That goes back to what I was saying earlier. But... When it comes to helping them, remember, we had already said through, the, through this quiz, they don't want to move from there to here any more than we want to move from here to here. So why don't we, in our ministry, move them from there to here? Biblical worldview is just another way of saying discipleship. It's teaching them what the Word of God has to say about issues that affect their lives financially. And this is a good place to start. I challenge you to go through these verses and look at them. See what, see what uh, you're doing, what you're not doing, and what God may want to impress upon you. Because it's not only important that they get from where they are to there, but that you and I get from where we are to there. And it's a whole lot better to say to them... We can do this in a journey. I know there's things I need to learn. Can we do this together? And all of a sudden, you're, you're, it's not like this. It's like this, and you're side by side. By the way, there's wealthy people that need Jesus. I mentioned to you two weeks ago, traditionally and historically, Southern Baptists have done an absolutely horrible job ministering to the rich. Because I think in our heart of hearts as middle class churches, we don't think we have anything to offer them. 
but we're wrong because they need Jesus. And a rich young ruler proved that to me. A rich young ruler who had it all. And Jesus said, no, you, you still lack. And so this is where we need to be thinking of when it comes to ministry. Paul said, though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone. To what? Win as many as possible. And then he makes these, these, this statement. He says, to the Jews I became like a Jew. Why? To win the Jews. Well, Paul, I thought you were a Jew. He was, but he was also the apostle to the Gentiles, as we've been seeing in our study in the book of Acts. But when it came to being in the synagogue, he knew how to be like a Jew so that he could win the Jews to Jesus. And he said, to those under the law, I became like one under the law, though, you know, to be honest, I myself, I'm not under the law. Why? So as to win those under the law. And then he said, to those having the law, I became like one, or to those not having the law, the Gentiles, I became like one not having the law. Though, actually, I'm not free from God's law. I'm under Christ's law. Why? To win those not having the law. He makes a statement in verse 22, to the weak I became weak to win the weak. Am I stretching this to add to the poor I became poor? I don't mean selling all I have. I mean recognizing the way they see the world and begin to relate to them based on how they see the world. That I have become all things to all men that by all possible means, and I, I prefer to say that I might see some saved. He says that I might save some, but we know that he doesn't save them. Jesus saves them. So he becomes all things to all men so that by all possible means he might see people saved. And he does it for the sake of the gospel. That he may share in its blessings. I hope that these two weeks have given you some food to chew on. I, I, these books will be up here. If you want to come and look at them, feel free. You've got the book list. You know where to look for them if you want to know more. This is the tip of the iceberg, folks. But the bottom line is if we're going to make sense of the signs we read from other cultures, you remember the first thing I showed you? Don't leave your rocks in the road. If we're going to make sense of the signs we see from other cultures, we're going to have to understand the culture. And that's what being a missionary is all about. All right, let's pray.